Chapter 6 Captain Jim Old Dr. Dave and Mrs. Dr. Dave had come down to the little house to greet the bride and groom. Dr. Dave was a big, jolly, white-whiskered old fellow, and Mrs. Doctor was a trim, rosy-cheeked, silver-haired little lady who took Anne at once to her heart, literally and figuratively. "'I'm so glad to see you, dear. You must be real tired. We've got a bite of supper ready, and Captain Jim brought up some trout for you. Captain Jim, where are you? Oh, he slipped out to see to the horse, I suppose. Come upstairs and take your things off.' Anne looked about her with bright, appreciative eyes as she followed Mrs. Dr. Dave upstairs. She liked the appearance of her new home very much. It seemed to have the atmosphere of Green Gables and the flavor of her old traditions. I think I would have found Miss Elizabeth Russell a kindred spirit, she murmured, when she was alone in her room. There were two windows in it. The dormer one looked out on the lower harbor, and the sandbar and the four winds light a magic casement opening on the foam of perilous seas in fairylands forlorn, quoted Anne softly. The gable window gave a view of a little harvest-hued valley through which a brook ran. Half a mile up the brook was the only house in sight, an old rambling gray one surrounded by huge willows through which its windows peered like shy seeking eyes into the dusk. Anne wondered who lived there. They would be her nearest neighbors, and she hoped they would be nice. She suddenly found herself thinking of the beautiful girl with the white geese. Gilbert thought she didn't belong here, mused Anne. But I feel sure she does. There was something about her that made her part of the sea and the sky and the harbor. Four winds is in her blood. When Anne went downstairs, Gilbert was standing before the fireplace talking to a stranger. Both turned as Anne entered. Anne, this is Captain Boyd. Captain Boyd, my wife. It was the first time Gilbert had said my wife to anybody but Anne, and he narrowly escaped bursting with the pride of it. The old captain held out a sinewy hand to Anne. They smiled at each other and were friends from that moment. Kindred spirit flashed recognition to kindred spirit. I'm right down pleased to meet you, Mistress Blythe, and I hope you'll be as happy as the first bride who came here. I can't wish you no better than that. But your husband doesn't introduce me just exactly right. Captain Jim is my week-a-day name, and you might as well begin as you're sartin to end up calling me that. You certainly are a nice little bride, Mistress Blythe. Looking at you sorter of makes me feel that I've just been married myself. Amid the laughter that followed, Mrs. Dr. Dave urged Captain Jim to stay and have supper with them. Thank you kindly. Twill be a real treat, Mistress Doctor. I mostly has to eat my meals alone, with the reflection of my ugly old fizz in a looking glass opposite for company. Tisn't often I have a chance to sit down with two such sweet, purty ladies. Captain Jim's compliments may look very bald on paper, but he paid them with such a gracious, gentle deference of tone and look that the woman upon whom they were bestowed felt that she was being offered a queen's tribute in a kingly fashion. Captain Jim was a high-souled, simple-minded old man with eternal youth in his eyes and heart. He had a tall, rather ungainly figure, somewhat stooped, yet suggestive of great strength and endurance. A clean-shaven face, deeply lined and bronzed, a thick mane of iron-gray hair falling quite to his shoulders, and a pair of remarkably blue, deep-set eyes, which sometimes twinkled and sometimes dreamed, and sometimes looked out seaward with a wistful quest in them, as of one seeking something precious and lost. Anne was to learn one day what it was for which Captain Jim looked. It could not be denied that Captain Jim was a homely man. His spare jaws, rugged mouth, and square brow were not fashioned on the lines of beauty, and he had passed through many hardships and sorrows which had marked his body as well as his soul. But though at first sight Anne thought him plain, she never thought anything more about it. The spirit shining through that rugged tenement beautified it so wholly. 
They gathered gaily around the supper table. The hearth fire banished the chill of the September evening, but the window of the dining room was open, and sea breezes entered at their own sweet will. The view was magnificent, taking in the harbor and the sweep of low purple hills beyond. The table was heaped with Mrs. Doctor's delicacies, but the piece de resistance was undoubtedly the big platter of sea trout. Thought they'd be sort or tasty after traveling, said Captain Jim. They're fresh as trout can be, Mistress Blythe. Two hours ago they were swimming in the Glen Pond. Who is attending to the light tonight, Captain Jim? asked Dr. Dave. Nephew Alec. He understands it as well as I do. Well, now I'm real glad you asked me to stay to supper. I'm proper hungry. Didn't have much of a dinner today. I believe you have starved yourself most of the time down at that light, said Mrs. Dr. Dave severely. You won't take the trouble to get up a decent meal. Oh, I do, Mr. Doctor, I do, protested Captain Jim. Why, I live like a king, generally. Last night, I was up to the glen and took home two pounds of steak. I meant to have a spanking good dinner today. And what happened to the steak? asked Mrs. Dr. Dave. Did you lose it on the way home? No. Captain Jim looked sheepish. Just at bedtime, a poor, ordinary sort of dog came along and asked for a night's lodging. Guess he belonged to some of the fishermen long shore. I couldn't turn the poor cur out. He had a sore foot. So I shut him in the porch with an old bag to lie on and went to bed. But somehow I couldn't sleep. Come to think it over, I sort of remembered that the dog looked hungry. And you got up and gave him that steak. All that steak, said Mrs. Dr. Dave with a kind of triumphant reproof. Well, there wasn't anything else to give him, said Captain Jim deprecatingly. Nothing a dog would care for, that is. I reckon he was hungry, for he made about two bites of it. I had a fine sleep the rest of the night. But my dinner had to be sort of scanty. Potatoes and point, as you might say. The dog, he lit out for home this morning. I reckon he weren't a vegetarian. The idea of starving yourself for a worthless dog, sniffed Mrs. Doctor. You don't know, but he may be worth a lot to somebody, protested Captain Jim. He didn't look of much account, but you can't go by looks in judging a dog. Like myself, he might be a real beauty inside. The first mate didn't approve of him, I'll allow. His language was right down forcible. But the first mate is prejudice. No use in taking a cat's opinion of a dog. At any rate, I lost my dinner. So this nice spread and this delightful company is real pleasant. It's a great thing to have good neighbors. Who lives in the house among the willows up the brook? asked Anne. Mrs. Dick Moore, said Captain Jim, and her husband, he added, as if by way of an afterthought. Anne smiled and deduced a mental picture of Mrs. Dick Moore, from Captain Jim's way of putting it, evidently a second Mrs. Rachel Lynde. You haven't many neighbors, Mistress Blythe, Captain Jim went on. This side of the harbor is mighty thinly settled. Most of the land belongs to Mr. Howard up yonder past the glen, and he rents it out for pasture. The other side of the harbor now is thick with folks, especially McAllister's. There's a whole colony of McAllister's. You can't throw a stone, but you hit one. I was talking to old Leon Blackyard the other day. He's been working on the harbor all summer. Dare nearly all McAllister's over thar, he told me. There's Neil McAllister and Sandy McAllister and William McAllister and Alec McAllister and Angus McAllister, and I believe there's De Devil McAllister. There are nearly as many Elliots and Crawfords, said Dr. Dave, after the laughter had subsided. You know, Gilbert, we folk on this side of Four Winds have an old saying, from the conceit of the Elliots, the pride of the McAllisters, and the vainglory of the Crawfords, good Lord, deliver us. There's plenty of fine people among them, though, said Captain Jim. I sailed with William Crawford for many a year, and
and for courage and endurance and truth that man hadn't an equal. They've got brains over on that side of four winds. Maybe that's why this side is sorter inclined to pick on them. Strange, ain't it, how folks seem to resent anyone being born a mite cleverer than they be. Dr. Dave, who had a forty years feud with the Over Harbor people, laughed and subsided. Who lives in that brilliant emerald house about half a mile up the road? asked Gilbert. Captain Jim smiled delightedly. Miss Cornelia Bryant, she'll likely be over to see you soon, seeing your Presbyterians. If you were Methodist, she wouldn't come at all. Cornelia has a holy horror of Methodists. She's quite a character, chuckled Dr. Dave, a most inveterate man-hater. Sour grapes? queried Gilbert, laughing. No, tisn't sour grapes, answered Captain Jim seriously. Cornelia could have had her pick when she was young. Even yet, she's only to say the word to see the old widowers jump. She just seems to have been born with a sort of chronic spite against men and Methodists. She's got the bitterest tongue and the kindest heart in four winds. Wherever there's any trouble, that woman is there, doing everything to help in the tenderest way. She never says a harsh word about another woman. And if she likes to card us poor scalawags of men down, I reckon our tough old hides can stand it. She always speaks well of you, Captain Jim, said Mrs. Doctor. Yes, I'm afraid so. I don't half like it. It makes me feel as if there must be something sort of unnatural about me.